when your vagus goes rogue, why your digestion feels out of control. The symptoms I'm talking about are acid reflux, pain, diarrhea, nausea, cramping, just erratic digestion. Additionally, feeling faint, lightheaded, dizzy. Your vagus nerve is like a super highway connecting your brain to a lot of different organs, specifically for the focus of this video, your digestive organs, and in addition, your heart and your diaphragm. And what the vagus controls amongst many other things are things called sphincters or valves. So these are what control the movement through your digestive tract. And there, there is a proper speed and motion. And of course, digestion starts at your mouth, ends in your anus, and it's a one directional flow. So everything should be going from up to down at the right speed. So these sphincters, like as an example, you have two in your esophagus, and what they do is they sense food or beverage coming, they open, allow it to pass, and then they close. Beautiful system, and as long as it's functioning like that, things are perfect. Uh, you have about 10 to 15 different sphincters. A lot of times we talk about the vagus nerve losing its tone, uh, being out of balance because you're too much in what's called fight or flight. Your sympathetic nervous takes over because the vagus is on the other side of the coin from your sympathetic fight or flight. It's on the parasympathetic side. So it's the rest, digest, relax side of the coin. And so when sympathetic gets too high, which is uh, what is often spoken about, then the vagus is, is deficient and it loses tone. And when, when it loses tone, those valves are, are not just like a muscle losing tone. They're kind of floppy. Uh, and they're also, they can be uh, too tight or too rigid. But regardless, they're, they're not functioning. They're not detecting the food and drink. They're not detecting the rhythm of how things should be happening. As an example, you have a sphincter in your stomach that allows the contents of your stomach to then pass into your small intestine. Well, food is supposed to be in your stomach for two to four hours, so that's the timing there. So it's churning things around. The acid is killing bad organisms. Also, you're digesting. The acid is allowing you to absorb certain key nutrients, and then at the end of that two to four hours, that sphincter opens and with the correct timing, lets things into your small intestine, your gallbladder has its own sphincter, it detects food, oh, now it's, in, it's left the stomach, it's entering the small intestine, yes, there is some fat in that meal, I need to do my thing, and then that sphincter opens and uh, bile enters your upper small intestine. It's an incredibly beautiful, complex system, and again, when it's working well, great. So we have the underactive, which is what we talk about a lot because somebody's too much in the sympathetic fight or flight uh, type of drive and you get these loose sphincters and you can get um, or, or too rigid. So the symptoms associated with that are, are the chronic reflux, the nausea, the upper abdominal discomfort uh, due to what's called gastroparesis. Gastro just means stomach. Paresis, you can think of more like close to paralysis. Things are just not digesting. Uh, patients comment that it feels like there's a brick in my stomach. Food seems to sit there forever. And that's that it's too slow. Things are not moving the way they should. However, what I want to talk to you about today is, is another side of the coin where the vagus can become uh, too active, okay? Not, not uh, underactive, but too active. And in that state, your parasympathetic nervous system is now too dominant over the sympathetic nervous system. Now what happens is the valves open too often or too early. And with that, you can get the stomach. So of course, if the stomach is supposed to contain those contents for two to four hours, if it's opening too early, then you get what's called a gastric dumping, which is just the stomach's dumping into the small intestine. So of course you're not getting that nice absorption, but now things are moving too rapidly. Um, your blood sugar can get erratic. That's where that faint lightheaded uh, issue can come from. Additionally, things can keep moving through and that's where you get the diarrhea that I mentioned. And uh, you can also get too much bile, too many pancreatic enzymes because the pancreas along with the gallbladder empties into the small intestine to uh, 
add their digestive benefits through enzymes and bile and you know again it's a, it's a beautiful symphony when it's working but if you get that more hyperactive vagus now things are just moving too quickly and too often and you're really got erratic digestion and you and you just not sure why things are passing too quickly as i mentioned you're faint you're lightheaded people sometimes move their bowels they feel like they're gonna keel over uh it's it's a terrible feeling of course gastroparesis the other side of the coin where it's just sitting there like a brick you're you're not happy with either equation but what I wanted to go over is why, you know, why, why does he get hyper? Because that's very rarely talked about. We tend to talk about the, the hypo functioning of the vagus. So um, interestingly, uh, the, the vagus can get affected to the hypo or hyper side from our friend hiatal hernia. Because what happens with a hiatal hernia is your diaphragm, your breathing muscle, you know, it's bowing up and down and moving nice and freely. And the opening in, in the middle here is for your esophagus, but your vagus passes right along with your esophagus through that opening. So when your stomach then pushes up through that opening, the vagus can get distorted and pressurized in different ways. And sometimes it can go hypo and sometimes it can go hyper. So hence these symptoms can occur. Also, abdominal distension, meaning you just overate, can put this kind of um, pressure on the vagus such that it gets into a hyper state with the symptoms I've mentioned. A big one is post-surgical changes because when people get hiatal hernia surgery, 20% of the time they have this dumping syndrome, which I just mentioned where things are passing too, through too quickly due to irritation to the vagus. And um, I was recently reading studies that talked about some sort of a tunnel structure that they're trying to create around the vagus so that when they do hiatal hernia surgery, they don't disrupt it. That's in its very, very early stages. But knowing that the, the, the vagus nerve can get damaged, irritated, stretched, et cetera, during the surgery is, is a known issue is a known problem associated with hiatal hernia surgery. Another issue is parasympathetic dominance because you have what's called low cortisol or you have adrenal fatigue. So you're more in that depressed state and that the vagus will reflect that. Also uh, neuroinflammatory. So of course the vagus nerve is, is a nerve. So hence neuro inflammation of it, which can come from chronic infections, mold, toxicity, autoimmune uh, activity. So autoimmune diseases can also cause it. So I'm just going through all the various ways the vagus can get into this hyper state. Also, you can get what's called high gastrin levels. So when you are on a PPI, a proton pump inhibitor, which is a prescribed strong antacid, Many times people learn about the side effects and they, they want to get off this. They want to stop taking it. Well, an interesting thing happens, which is your, your brain knows that your stomach should be producing acid. So now you're on this medication that is uh, preventing acid from being produced to a great majority. And so the brain basically starts yelling at your stomach saying, why isn't there any acid? It is your job to produce acid, produce acid. And of course, the brain doesn't know you're on this drug that's preventing you from making acid. It just knows that it has a job, which is to, to make sure that that stomach produces acid because that's its job and it's obviously not doing it. So it, in its urgency to say, make acid, make acid, make acid, the human body is so incredible. So they, the, the stomach produces more cells, actually produces more cells that can produce this hormone called gastrin, which makes hydrochloric acid. And so when somebody has been on an antacid for several months, let alone years, let alone decades, because I meet people across all those time trajectories. Um, so now they, they start to diminish their PPI and as they're diminishing it, now all those new abundant cells go, oh, yay, I can do my job and make acid. And you get this rebound of too much acid actually being produced. And in this scenario, that's very irritating to the vagus and it can get into this uh, hyper state. Also stress, stress can cause what's called a vasovagal response. And that has to do with that lightheaded nausea, feeling faint 
situation. And um, so those are the whole list of things. And it's interesting how you've got your hiatal hernia, you've got overeating, you've got uh, PPIs and trying to get off of them, and then the, the toxins of, of um, mold and chronic infections. All the things that we take into consideration when we're working with hiatal hernia and chronic acid reflux. So um, this issue of the vagus, you know, hypo or hyper is really impacting a lot of people. So what do you do about it? Now, from the viewpoint of sensibly getting off the PPI with help, of course, helping your hiatal hernia so you don't have all that upward pressure, which tends to come from food sensitivities, dysbiosis, an imbalance of the good bacteria and bad bacteria. And at the root of that, you can have infections, you can have mold toxicity or other form of toxicity. So it all really fits together in, in our analysis of how we think about this. So you just have to see what's true for the individual. Um, but in addition to that, we, we want to look at things you can do day to day and they're so they both have to be done is what I'm trying to say. So I'm going to give you some things you can do uh, yourself and then you want to work with a clinician who's going to get to those other root causes that I just mentioned so that you're not doing positive but it's not quite enough because the, the gut, your uh, immune system, etc. needs rebalancing. So there's uh, box breathing. You can look up how you do that. There's also what's called a physiological sigh where you take a take a nice deep breath in, but then you very slowly through pursed lips, breathe out as slowly as you possibly can. And you're going to really feel, oh, I need to inhale, but try to just discipline yourself, get better and better at this because it really helps the vagus. And you can do this 10 to 20 times a day. Also humming. It's a very specific way to hum. So it's not like, <laughs> it's it's a deep hum that rattles, vibrates in your chest. That's the hum that helps balance the vagus nerve. So it's a specific way to do that. Um, also, there's testing for the vagus nerve. You can see what your HRV is. I wear a whoop band. You can, there's a lot of different metrics out there that can check your HRV. There are gastric emptying studies that you can do. That's a gastroenterologist type of test to see if your stomach's, uh, whether it's moving too fast or too slow, it would be too fast, of course, in this hyper state. And then um, there's something called a manometry test. So that's the pressure to see how that, that sphincter that I was talking about earlier is holding up, whether it's, it's uh, functioning normally or not. Because they in the manometry, they can see the undulations of the esophagus as you're swallowing and, and seeing if, how the sphincters are working. So that's the testing. Those are things you can do at home and things you want to have a clinician help you work with to really balance this out. And then you have happy digestion again. That's what I want for you. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, consider liking it, subscribe to the channel, and write me a comment. I answer all my comments and I love to hear from you. We'll talk soon.